What is going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. Yes, ya boy dyed his hair black. It's something I've wanted to do for a very long time and now that it's black, you know, I'm probably gonna have to get it like dyed black again. I only use like one box and my hair is so thick and so long that I might need to use like two different boxes, but this is definitely a starting point and now that my hair is super black, I kind of want to get like dark red, like almost blood red ghost roots. You guys know what I mean? Something like that? I don't know. I feel like that might look cool. Let me know what you guys think. So, you guys seemed to really enjoy the commentary video I did on anyone but you, and this is something that I'm really starting to enjoy doing on my channel. Most of my most successful videos, in fact, I think it's safe to say all of my most successful videos, have been more long-form, discussion-based, conversational pieces where I watch something beforehand, and then I sit down in front of the camera and have like a, a very long, in-depth uh, discussion about it, sort of like a beat-by-beat -beat recap of the major events of whatever piece of media we're talking about. And today we are talking about Wonka. So Wonka was written by Paul King and Simon Farnaby, and it was directed by Paul King, a director who directed directing, director, director, blah, 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 blah. Paddington 1 and Paddington 2, which are incredible films and very unexpectedly so. I don't think anybody was expecting Paddington 1 and Paddington 2 to be seen as not only as two of the best uh, family films of all time, but like a lot of people consider those movies to just be some of the most entertaining movies ever made. Just the joy and the the energy of those films is so infectious. Paddington 2 in particular is just fucking amazing. Like not even just as a, a nice family movie that you can watch with your whole family on like a fun movie night or something, but just as a film as well, like writing, directing, acting, cinematography, everything about it is genuinely so fucking good. So that actually got me really excited when it was announced that Paul King was going to be directing this film as well and also have a hand in the writing room. Yes, there was that one viral trailer with that one moment that got clipped out of Timothy Chalamet being like, so quiet up and listen down. No, scratch that, reverse it. Yes, out of context, out of the context of the film in that trailer, it it was it was pretty cringe. Let, let's not lie to ourselves. Even those of us who enjoyed this movie have to admit that line is pretty fucking cringy. So in effect, essentially, this film works as a prequel to the original 1971 film Willy Wonka and The Chocolate Factory. Our main cast here consists of Timothy Chalamet or Timothée Chalamet uh, as Willy Wonka himself, and then we have Kala Lane as Noodle, Olivia Coleman as Mrs. Scrubbit, Peterson Joseph as Slugworth, and then we have Hugh Grant in here as the Oompa Loompa. Critical and commercial reception with this movie was actually fairly surprising to me. It has a 7 out of 10 on IMDb on Rotten Tomatoes, 82% critic score, and a 91% audience score. I remember when those numbers came out, I was like, what? I mean, it, the movie was being directed by Paul King. I didn't think that it was going to be a bad movie, but just the vibes that I got from the trailer and the general discussion around it, I didn't expect this level of praise. More so what I expected is actually what Metacritic gives us, which is a 66 critic score and a 5.9 user score. As I said in the Anyone But You video, Metacritic is brutal. I think it is the most brutal critic site on the internet. So we're about to get into the beat by beat recap of all the major events in the film and it is all with the goal of answering one question. How hard did the Willy wonk? Was I satisfied with the way that this movie wonked my Willy? What was the quality of the wonking upon thy Willy? Well, let's jump into it. Spoiler warning right up front. We're gonna go through everything that happens in this movie, every major spoiler. So if you have not seen the film and you care about spoilers, go and watch the film, come back to the video. If you don't care about spoilers, then stay and have a good time. And if you've seen the film, let's have some fun talking about it. Willy Wonka, an aspiring magician, inventor, and chocolatier above all else, arrives in Europe up to establish his chocolate shop at the Glaris Gourmet. It's this sort of rundown, abandoned building that's available for rent, but he's not very liquid right now. He doesn't really have much money, so he can't afford it. So he has to establish a name for himself and start making some money so that he can achieve this dream of this fantastical chocolate shop that he has in his head, this vision that he has. He is coerced to stay at Mrs. Scrubbit's boarding house by her henchman, Bleacher. And despite the warning that Wonka gets from an orphan who is also living at this boarding house named Noodle, her warning to, for, for 
for him to read the fine print of the document, Wonka signs it anyway because he is illiterate. He cannot read. He certainly has a way with words and a way with charisma, but the dude cannot read. One of the things that was included in this fine print is that everything has a fucking fee. <laughs> Just like the college I'm staying at now. They find a way to insert an extra fee anywhere they goddamn please. And it's established that Willie's going to have to pay these people 10,000 whatever the name of the currency is in this movie. I already forgot what it was. Let's just say $10,000 for the sake of this video. We can just say $10,000 so that it makes more sense for us. So to pay them off, Wonka introduces his newest invention, hover chocks, chocolates that make people fly, facing opposition from three rival chocolatiers who are living right across the street, or I guess operating their business right across the street from this abandoned uh, property that Willy Wonka wants to rent out for his chocolate shop. And these rival chocolatiers call the chief of police to confiscate Wonka's earnings for disrupting trade and selling without a chocolate store. Unable to pay the expensive fees imposed on him by the contract, Wonka is captured and forced to work in a lingerette for Mrs. Scrubba alongside five other captives, including Noodle. Learning of a so-called chocolate cartel plot involving the rival chocolatiers, Wonka makes his escape with the help of Noodle. And I just gotta say, this is genuinely the heartbeat of the film for me. There's one thing with Wonka's past that really hit me towards the end and then also his relationship with Noodle is so sweet and we're going to get to that. So Wonka and Noodle travel to the local zoo to produce his signature chocolate and the thing is with this particular chocolate he can't use regular old cow's milk he requires giraffe milk. So at this zoo they milk a giraffe named Abigail and they've roped in all the other lingerie workers that are being held captive at this boarding home so everybody's in on it they're all looking to make money so that they can pay off their dues and be free and of course so Wonka can have his his uh, dreamed chocolate shop. So together with the other lingerie workers, they embark on a chocolate selling crusade to alleviate their debts while using tunnels underneath the city to evade the police. The persistent thief of Wonka's chocolates is unmasked as an Oompa Loompa named Lofty, who reveals that the Oompa Loompas seek retribution for the cocoa beans Wonka originally took from Loompa Land. This is something that's referenced and that we go back to several times throughout the film, where when Wonka was a kid, his mom would collect cocoa beans so that Wonka can make chocolate and always took a lot of time. So those are the beans that the Oompa Loompas are referring to. Using the funds raised from selling chocolates, Wonka and the lingerie workers open Wonka's dream chocolate store. They finally achieve the goal of opening that chocolate store and Wonka employs all these fellow lingerettes that he's established close friendships with as his employees at this chocolate shop. And it is dreamlike. It looks incredible. The production design of this set in particular is so breathtaking. The chief and the cartel now unable to arrest him since he has a legitimate shop, expose him to scrub it. They let her in on this mischievous uh, sort of under the table plan that Wonka has orchestrated with all of her employees. So Scrub It incites chaos among the customers by infusing the chocolates with Yeti sweats, leading to the destruction of Wonka's store. And we're going to get into a deeper discussion about my positives and negatives with the film when we're done with this beat by beat recap. What I will say is the scene isolated to itself, the scenes in the chocolate store when it's up and running are brilliant. Writing wise though, this section of the film does feel a little rushed to me. It's like, oh, okay, he got the chocolate shop set up and then it comes crashing down almost immediately. And where that would work for maybe a smaller victory, like, yes, he made his first stack of cash and then it gets taken away from him or there's like another reason why he's still not able to afford something. That's a small victory, but it's just important to the character enough so that when it comes crashing down, it doesn't feel like rushed writing. It feels like a natural progression. But with this, this has been his dream ever since he was a child to have his own chocolate shop and he gets it up and running it's so amazing and then it I mean maybe just one or two more scenes within this chocolate shop and seeing it up and running and seeing the operations of it would have sufficed for this but it it just feels a little too immediate and a little too rushed for me it feels like they're a little bit of forced emotion here in the script. I mean, it works for sure, but just from an objective critical standpoint, it is something I picked up on. So Wonka has given an offer, and that offer is that if he leaves town, completely ceases to exist in this area, and not fulfill his dream of the chocolate shop, all of the debts of all of his friends that he has made at this boarding house will be paid off, and they will all be free, including Noodle, who is the one that he arguably has the closest relationship with. And Wonka agrees. He agrees to leave town by ship to pay off everyone's debts 
Laundrettes except Noodle, who is kept at the Laundrette by Arthur Slugworth. And there's a bit of a scandal going on here. Wonka was under the impression that she would be freed. We now learn that she will not be freed for reasons that we'll get into. Those reasons being that Wonka is able to deduce that Noodle and Slugworth are related based on this little pendant on a ring that Noodle has and that Slugworth also has. So Wonka and Lofty are both on this boat together and they're under the impression that they're not coming back and Wonka is just going to be on his way, but they are forced to jump off the boat when they realize it is rigged with an explosive and they have to rescue Noodle. Everybody comes together and they devise a strategy to obtain the cartel's incriminating account book to, you know, take them to court and get everything settled out. Using Abigail as a distraction, Wonka and Noodle infiltrate the cartel's base. Slugworth discloses his misdeeds and Wonka and Noodle are nearly drowned in a vault of chocolate but are rescued by Lofty. Which, by the way, this was the first point in the movie that actually really got to me. It got me to shed tears because it, it almost reminded me of that moment in Toy Story 3 when all the toys like are being lowered into that burner and they have that really dark moment where they all hold hands and accept like, okay, we're gonna die. Thank you for being my friends. Here we go. That's exactly what this moment reminded of, and it has done so well. Obviously, it's a ridiculous concept drowning in a giant vat of chocolate, but in the moment, it really does work. Like, literally, like, Timothy Chalamet, the way he delivers this line where he's just like, take a breath now, it's, ugh, ugh. It is so good. And the music, too, the soft, gentle piano of it, like, Paul King really knows how to get into your feels. But as I said, they are rescued by Lofty, and Wonka and Noodle expose the cartel's misdeeds to the authorities and release the cartel's chocolate reserve through a fountain, ruining the cartel's enterprise. The police arrest the corrupt chief, and Scrub It and Bleacher are arrested for their complicity in the cartel's scheme. Wonka shares the last chocolate bar his mother gave him with his friends, discovering a golden paper with a meaningful message. Essentially, this message is it's not about the chocolate, it's about who you share it with. And this, this is yet another beat in the movie that makes up the soul and the heart of the film for me and really, really got to me. Throughout the movie, we get allusions to Wonka's mother and hints about his past and him talking about his mother and how she passed away and everything and how she promised him that she would be by his side when he fulfilled his dreams one day, when he finally achieved them. Obviously, she can't physically be there because she passed away. But in this moment, he does have a vision of her standing there with this smile on her face that really just says, I am so proud of you, son. And when he opens that last chocolate bar that she gave him before she died, and he sees that message, and it's it's not about the chocolate, it's who you share it with. Ugh! Who expected this? Who expected this from Wonka? The willy is wonking so hard right now. <laughs> it's genuinely so tender and genuine and touching and just, it's it's really good. I'm so, it's really good. And Timothy Chalamet, we're gonna get into this, is really fucking good in this movie. I don't want to hear fucking shit. So Willie reunites Noodle with her mother, Dorothy Smith, and settles his debt with Lofty, which is the final, like, really touching moment of the movie for me with um, Noodle being reunited with her mother, who she was lied to and told was dead. Wonka finds an abandoned castle for sale to start building his own chocolate factory with Lofty as his tasting chef and that in a nutshell is the events of the Wonka movie okay so let's acknowledge the elephant in the room Timothy Chalamet <laughs> I personally love Timothy Chalamet and I don't think many people disagree that he's talented I think most people think he's talented but he has sort of fallen into that trap of the teen heartthrob of Hollywood even though he's not even a fucking teenager anymore but it that doesn't really matter it's more so how actual teens react to him yeah the guy's attractive he has that like boyish charm teenage heartthrob Hollywood cliche vibe and aesthetic to him but he is also a genuinely really talented actor and he always chooses very nuanced and interesting projects. He has such a diverse filmography. For example, he can be in Wonka, the super lighthearted origin story of Willy Wonka, the most like over-the-top character ever written, but he can also be a lead in Bones and All, a cannibalistic romance. My point is, I think the guy has a very versatile acting range, and I think he has a very nuanced career of really good movies, definitely more great than not. And with that being said, I think everybody in the movie did a really, really good job. Kala Lane as Noodle? 
Ugh! The heartbeat of this film for sure. Her chemistry with Timothy Chalamet on screen is rock solid, and it's really what makes those moments towards the end that I talked about that much more impactful. Now there is an aspect of the film that I haven't talked about yet, and you're probably like, that seems like a pretty big part of the movie to not talk about, and that is that yes, this film is a musical. Now I'm gonna say this right off the bat. Timothy Chalamet has a lot of experience in theater. He can sing. He is a good singer. Do I think that they kind of butchered the songs in this movie? Not entirely. They're all very catchy, and I've found myself humming several of them throughout my day today, but I don't know what it is about these big-budget Hollywood mo movie musicals and their fear to sound too musical theatery. I don't know, I feel like that's kind of fucking dumb. <laughs> I think it's pretty safe to say that musical theater is not as inaccessible to the mainstream as it used to be. And as much as some musical theater purists would hate to admit it, we do have to acknowledge that what Lin-Manuel Miranda did with Hamilton probably has a lot to do with that, with releasing it on Disney+, Plus, having it professionally filmed, and allowing anybody who wants to watch it to watch it. Whatever your thoughts on Hamilton may be, or Lin-Manuel Miranda as an artist, you cannot ignore the impact that that had on getting mainstream audiences to open themselves up more to musical theater. By the way, Hamilton's fucking amazing. Call me basic all you want. If you ask me, it's basic to not like Hamilton at this point, so... Suck it. So the songs are catchy, they're fairly well written and composed, but yeah, Timothy Chalamet wasn't really given much to work with here, range speaking. He sort of just sings in about the same one or two octaves the entire time, and it's... I don't know, it's a little underwhelming, especially since he is the lead of the movie, and more often than not, the lead singer of these songs. You just kind of expect him to have more moments that stand out, musically speaking. You kind of expect, at the climax of these songs, for him to hit some, like, really impressive note, or at least a note that's a little bit higher, or has a bit of a more flair to it than the other vocals that he's had to provide throughout the track. And again, I don't think any of that criticism can really be thrown onto Timothy Chalamet. He's not the one in there mixing and producing the tracks. He's not the one in there, you know, deciding what key he's going to sing in. It's just me personally, as somebody who, like, knows that Timothy Chalamet could really bring it in a full-on, really impressive, vocally speaking, musical, it kind of disappointed me that they didn't give him more to work with. Or maybe his range genuinely is a lot more limited than I think it is, and maybe they did want to push him a little further, but he just couldn't do it. Who knows? At the end of the day, the songs are catchy, and they get stuck in your head, and they're really lively, and the musical scene sequences, choreography-wise, directing-wise, they're all very well done. They're very well staged, in my opinion, and so the, the, the music aspect of the film overall didn't really take away that much. I actually really enjoyed it. I think it added a lot to the film. I also just love how ridiculous this movie is, you know? In a time where it seems like all movies, even, even family-friendly movies, seem to feel the need to be as grounded and as realistic as possible, it's nice to have somebody like Paul King, I, I don't know, it's, I'm just thankful that somebody like him is working in the industry to provide us with this over-the-top, not grounded, head-in-the-clouds aesthetics throughout the entire thing type movies for us to enjoy because it is extremely entertaining and I think the audience and most of the critical reception to this movie reflects that. People do enjoy super over-the-top movies like this when they are done well. I mean if you really think about it this movie has the most ridiculous plot and I'm not even talking about the concept of the character of Willy Wonka but this whole thing with the chocolate cartel and the underground stash of chocolate and it's like drowning people in a giant vat of chocolate. It's just it's it's fucking ridiculous. It's ridiculous, and I love it, because the movie treats it so well. The film genuinely has a good sense of when to take itself seriously and when to not, and it walks that line, treads that water very, very carefully, I would say. The costumes, the makeup, the cinematography, the production design, on a technical level, almost every aspect of this movie is really well done. The one technical aspect of it that didn't really work for me, though, was unfortunately a lot of the CGI, particularly with Hugh Grant as the Oompa Loompa, who does a great job as this character, and it didn't fully take me out of the experience, but anytime he's on screen, it is just very much like, that is a CGI character. Obviously, we were gonna know that he was CGI either way, but it's one of those things where, like, you kind of can't stop thinking about it as you're watching it. Didn't completely sever me from the experience, but it was definitely towards the forefront of my mind anytime he was on screen. I also appreciated how nuanced the story was. The backstory with Willy Wonka's mom, but also the backstory with Noodle and all the various plot points that come to a head in the finale and the climax of the film. It's actually surprisingly deep and nuanced and almost 
almost complex, I would say. Uh, for, for what you expect this movie to provide you with. Yeah, you could say at the end of the day, the message of the movie is super basic, follow your dreams, you know, love the people around you, and like, you know, the people who matter the most are, are the people you love, and you know, s you stay with friends and family and all that stuff, but like, sure, it's a message we've heard a million times, but it's one of the few messages out there that is truly timeless, in my opinion, and with a director like Paul King at the helm of a movie spreading those messages, I am more than okay with it. I think the way he executed that in this movie- See, here's the thing. I'm not someone who particularly cares if something is cliche as long as the cliche is done well. You don't even have to put an insanely unique spin on that singular cliche. You just need to do it well, and if you do it well, I'm going to appreciate that. At a certain point, yes, you know, may maybe we'll get some cliche fatigue when it comes to these types of movies, but I just don't think that's the case with this one. Maybe it's because so much of the stuff I watch is so mature and dark and fucked up, but that's just my personal experience. I can only talk about my personal experience with the movie. I would have loved to have seen this in a theater with my friends and family. I think that would have been an absolute blast. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to, but now that I have watched it on HBO, HBO Max where it is streaming currently as of recording this HBO Max is weird with how they add and take away shows all the time and, and movies obviously but I don't know now that I have watched it what I'm saying is I want to share it with everybody literally afterwards I texted my boyfriend and then we got on the phone later and I was like dude you need to watch this it's actually like so good it made me cry it's really fucking good you need to watch it I want to share this movie with everybody it's just such a joyful amazingly happy experience while still having a very solid heart beating at its center. Granted, maybe my love of the film is due in part to my somewhat low expectations going into it, but even going into it, I was still very optimistic and hopeful about it because of the talent involved, and so, I don't know, that- that's pretty much my take on the movie. Guys, be sure to let me know what you thought of Wonka down in the comments. Just make sure you keep everything respectful down there. I really want my comments to be a safe space for everybody, and I need to start saying that in every video because some people haven't gotten the memo. Legitimately though, guys, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this film. It's not as polarizing as I thought it would be. Most people who have seen it seem to be at least like, oh yeah, yeah, that was decent, or all the way to where I'm at, where like, that was actually kind of great. Really curious to hear all those thoughts. Thank you guys so much for watching. Look forward to more videos coming very, very soon. I have a lot of really fun ideas, really cool things that I'm working on. Still working on the Walking Dead Season 2 video. If you've watched my Anyone But You video, you know it. You know why it's taking me so long, but I promise it is coming. I am in crunch time on it right now. Really, I'm, I'm, I'm handling a lot of things right now. Okay, uh, I just got done with midterms in the spring semester of my college, um, time, and I, did I just have an aneurysm? Spring break ended, Easter just happened, and oh yeah, don't even get me started on that whole controversy. <laughs> Not that there's anything in this room that would lead you to a conclusion of where I would stand on that controversy, I really can't think of anything that is in here that would even hint at a, at a, at a, at a implication of, of my stances. So at the beginning of this video, I said we were going to answer the question, did the Willy Wonk? Well, I'm so happy to say that this was the best wonking of the Willy that I've personally ever experienced. My Willy was so satisfied after watching this movie, it was wonked so hard and it was wonked so well with such care and heart. Genuinely the best wonking experience I've ever had on my Willy. Thank you so much, as always, for watching. If you would like to follow my personal and creative endeavors outside of YouTube, you can follow me on Instagram at the Xavier Reichbaum. That is my public account if you would like to follow my career. You can also follow me on my other account on Instagram at Headspace Productions, which is the official account for my production company, Headspace Productions. I also have a podcast. It's called the Headspace Podcast. If you're really into long, in-depth discussions, even more in-depth than the discussion you got here today and with the Anyone But You video, just really more in-depth than any discussion you're going to get on the main channel, go and check out that podcast. It's available on all major podcast streaming platforms, most namely Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Would really appreciate it if you guys check that out. I really do enjoy doing that podcast. Guys, thank you once again so much as always for watching. I will see you in the next video, and until then, keep writing, keep shooting, and keep editing.